right, welcome everybody. We are very excited to be here today. I am Kat Duncan. I'm the Director of Innovation at the Reynolds Journalism Institute. Um, I manage the RJI Fellows Program, and I'm really excited for you all to get to see all these great resources today and how you can use them in your newsrooms and your communities. So we will go right into the presentations and get started. If at any point you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat, the Q&A, or the Google Doc. We'll take one or two questions after each presentation um, to make sure we have time for everybody to show you their resources. And then at the end, we will take more questions with whoever um, is here when we wrap up. All right, so uh, to Moa, please take us away. Tamala, unmute. Can you see me? Yep, you're all good. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Tamala Calzadilla, and I would like to introduce you to my bilingual guide for journalists covering Latino and Spanish speaking communities. Tips, tools, data, and useful sources for your coverage. I'm a Venezuelan immigrant and leader in investigative journalism specialized in fact-checking, serving Spanish-speaking communities in the US since 2015. Now I'm the editor-in-chief of factcheckado.com. Factcheckado is an initiative to combat myths and disinformation impacting Latino communities that publishes fact-checking articles, videos, and explainers while building an alliance with more than 70 media outlets and organizations across the country Thanks to RJI, the Fact Checkado team, our Fact Checkado partners in the picture, and the support of the educational teams of Checkado.com and Maldita.es, co-founders of Fact Checkado, today I can introduce you to this guide. We conducted some surveys among our allies to understand their needs better and how the, they perceive the problem. We asked them about eight of the main topics where previous studies had identified misinformation or information gaps among the Latino population, COVID-19, immigration processes, political issues, and others. Our final takeaway is that there is not a lot of reliable information about these topics in Spanish, but there is a huge amount of disinformation. Above on the left, you can see the responses about the lack of information problem or information desserts. Below, you can see the answers about the disinformation problem in these specific issues. On the right, you see part of the survey about the tools that they need for their journalistic work. In this part, we ask, how well do you know these tools? How useful would it be to you to know these? How useful would it be to have tutorials? with examples, and how useful would it be to have a list with links and contacts of organizations who work with Latino communities? With all this input, we prepared our toolkit. The guide consists in five parts, provided in both English and in Spanish. The first one is why we created this guide and explain why Latino communities are more vulnerable to mis- and disinformation. The second part is a map of tools. In the third, we offer keys to reach Latino communities through WhatsApp and social media and some best practices. In the fourth part, we explain most appropriate terms to refer to these communities in journalistic coverage. And the fifth, have a list of reliable sources. But I want to focus on the core of this guide, which is the map of 17 online tools. We have, for example, a tool to verify content in general, like Google Advanced Search, how to verify images with Google Lens, Yandex, Invit, Photo Forensic, tools for geolocalization like Google Earth. Um, also, we have tools to detect information needs of our audiences like Google Trends and tools to verify speeches. In addition, we explain how to use Hive moderation to check artificial intelligence. This is what you can find in each tutorial. The title, tips, like none of the tools for detecting AI creations are 100% accurate. 
what's it, what, what is it, what is it for? And you can see a screenshot of the search and results to show how each tool works. Like in this example with Pope Francisco wearing a white winter coat, a famous creation with AI that went viral. You can explore a tutorial of other tools like Invid to check videos and generate photograms, Google Earth to find places and accurate information of some locations, Google Lens to check if an image was published before context and credits of pictures, and Wayback Machines to find posts, tweets, or websites that have been removed. At the end, we have reliable sources like organizations, not just in the Spanish language, but with focus in Latino communities. For example, Unidos US, before La Raza, and Brennan Center for Justice in Español, with expert analysis and data of electoral issues and Latino vote. I hope this guide is very useful for everyone. It is open to suggestions and comments. You can contact me by email and follow me on Fachaqueado. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody have a question at this point for Tamoa? None at this point. All right. If you come up with any questions at any point, feel free to put them in the doc or in the chat and I will keep track. Jen, take it away. Thanks, Kat. Um, I'm Jen Mizgada. I'm founder and principal at Little Key. Um, our consulting work helps clients build sustainable organizations and our coaching clients find new ways forward in their work. I'm really excited to share all of this work for my RJA fellowship with you today. So I'll just share my screen real quick. Good? Yep, all good. Great. Okay. Um, news organizations can be stressful places to work. Let me just move you guys. There we go. Um, leaders either don't know or don't prioritize how to create better organizational culture. News leaders who want to build and improve work culture face internal and external pressures. Workload is intense for people at many levels of the organization, especially founders. Newsroom fo newsrooms focus on outcomes and deliverables, um, sometimes at the cost of individual well being. We are hyper responsive to outside events and audience demands. We have high expectations, especially around the quality of work and ethics. Teams are often navigating past harm connected to identity and sometimes other employers. Um, and years of layoffs and instability have really increased in feelings of insecurity and sometimes mistrust among staff. Oops. Hey, buddy. I practiced. Um, our solution is an action-oriented training to shift mindset towards creating transparent, accountable, and caring work cultures. Um, so we've created um, a tool that really focuses on transparency, which addresses management best practices, including how leadership shares information about the business, upcoming projects, and how staff roles develop over time. Accountability addresses staff expectations and the reliability when it comes to colleagues and deadlines. Um, and care addresses the ethos of the organization overall, um, how management and staff behaviors fit together and how mindful colleagues are of each other. I know that working on culture can be overwhelming. I've heard from lots of people that they don't know where to start or they don't know where to look for help. So I created Building News Culture, which is a weekly email course for news leaders who are building culture with actions that can be used by anyone who wants to make change. Instead of sifting through research or guessing where to start, you get curated resources delivered to your inbox so you can access them when you need them. A weekly cadence helps create a learning habit. We don't want to overwhelm you with too much information at once, but we do want to help you keep momentum on the work that you're doing. Three frameworks help you build knowledge over time and address distinct needs. We start with a foundational understanding of culture. Um, then we address team dynamics and individual well-being. Three different newsroom case studies from Arizona Luminaria, Utante, and the 19th. Look at how organizations build cu culture at different stages in their sustainability, um, according to Lion. So the newsrooms are in the building, growing, and maintaining stages. For you, um, you know, this course really addresses needs I heard from over 120 different newsrooms. Um, sorry, 120 different people working in journalism who want to improve their work culture. Um, it will help you by creating actions, tools, and templates to help you get started where you are um, without too much of a learning curve, right? We know that news people are busy 
Every email has clear places for you to start and take action immediately with resources to help you go deeper when you're ready on processes like hiring. It'll give you perspective and help you break patterns. So shifting how we think about newsroom culture is key to transforming newsrooms. This course takes a solutions-oriented approach, sharing programs, policies, and practices that have made a positive impact in organizations. As um, Irene from Arizona Luminaria told me, you don't always have to do things the way they've always been done. Um, and it'll help you expand your knowledge on what you can change. In busy organizations that respond to the role we're in, we sometimes focus on symptoms and not systems. To expand the conversation around work culture beyond burnout and bad bosses, this course includes frameworks to anchor into research and best practices on organizational culture, teaming, and staff needs. Each time we introduce a framework from outside of journalism, we also give examples from newsrooms that show why a key concept is important, how a newsroom applied it, and what you can do. There's six Google Doc templates to help you develop a strategy on improving your workplace culture. Each lesson includes links to additional resources on the topics covered. At the end of the course, you get to download a full list of the frameworks and more than 40 resources. And then we address these shared challenges that we heard from folks, providing structure and guidance on how to work together, including workflows, addressing values alignment within an organization, growing teams, including hiring, delineating work areas, and growing into roles, improving communications, so developing systems and habits for both editorial and team communications, alleviating leadership bottlenecks, so while key to decisions, leaders are often overstretched across business and editorial, um, and then improving team dynamics, right? So making space for a variety of perspectives and needs where you are. Um, over 135 people have already started taking the course this week. You can sign up at bit.ly.com slash build news culture um, and reach out to me if you're interested in workshops or using the materials with groups. We all deserve transparent, accountable, and caring workplaces. Building news culture can help you start improving your workplace today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we do have a question. So she says, this is wonderful. Will the email course be asynchronous? Folks can sign up at any time. Yep, folks can sign up at any time. It's live now. Um, so the way the course works is when you sign up, you immediately get a welcome email and then your first email comes the next day. So if you like to read emails like this in the morning, you might want to sign up in the morning because it'll set a pattern for when you get the emails in the future. And um, yep, it is, it's designed, it's going to be up indefinitely. So if you want to start this in three months, you can start it three months from now or you can start it today. Great. Any other questions for Jen? At this point, no, okay. Maria, you are up. Hi everyone, uh, my name is, uh, sorry, I want to present, not to share. Uh, my name is Maria Arce and I'm super excited to introduce uh, to, to you today, Arena, a toolkit that is designed to harness the power of uh, ham radio uh, operations or amateur radio operations uh, in the aftermath of natural disasters for reporters and newsrooms. Uh, why focus on amateur radio? Simply put, it's the only communication method that can uh, withstand the devastating impact of a category five hurricane as it happened in Puerto Rico in 2017. Uh, when Hurricane Maria knocked down 95% of cell sites uh, and um, left 3.5 million people without power and internet for up to 11 months. Uh, my a toolkit will guide you through the steps to get uh, uh, radio licenses um, as required by the Federal Communication Commission, uh, ensuring that you are equipped uh, with um, uh, to communicate effectively in, in, in times of uh, crisis like this. From purchasing uh, your first uh, radio equipment, which doesn't have to break the bank with uh, very efficient uh, options available for just uh, $19, uh, to understanding the FCC regulations, every aspect uh, is covered to ensure compliance and efficiency. Uh, in the toolkit, I explain how in times of natural disasters, the strict FCC rules and norms for reporters are uh, relaxed, allowing newsrooms to use amateur radio to conduct, for example, vital check-ins with uh, reporters deployed uh, 
on the field and how to gather critical information. And also what you can't do, for example, to broadcast a new show through the frequencies assigned uh, to amateur radio. Through ARENA, uh, you will learn how to receive real-time updates from ham radio operators on what it's called uh, infrastructure damage or welfare status. Um, and for example, those are like bridges that uh, fell down, blocks that are roads, uh, dams that are threatening to collapse. And it will also help you identify communities in need of assistance that can also shape your coverage. You can also hear from a Skywarn Spotters, a volunteer program created by the National Weather Service with up to 400,000 people all over the US uh, who are uh, trained to report on severe uh, weather. Uh, additionally, uh, the toolkit provides guidance on uh, how to um, forge partnerships with uh, radio clubs and amateur um, radio emergency services. I'm also providing uh, a draft of a memorandum of understanding to sign with those groups uh, to establish methods of cooperation and assist them. And it's based on the MO signed by the Red Cross and other ham radio services in the US. Uh, you will also find practical advice uh, on designing and executing drills and creating what it's called after action report that will help you um, uh, practice and be ready uh, for, for the next uh, disaster. I want to emphasize that this tool uh, focuses in low cost solutions, targeting a small local newsrooms, which I consider the first, the first responders of communication, especially in these cases. Just to give you an example, a GMRS license, which is one of the uh, licenses that are explained in the, in the toolkit, it only costs $35. So we can say with as little as $55, you can uh, jump into the airwaves and be better prepared for the next uh, disaster. Already, we have trained two newsrooms in Puerto Rico. They, um, the reporters, seven reporters, um, have all received their radio equipment. They all have their GMRS licenses, and that's thanks to the support of the uh, RJI Fellowship. And I have a third newsroom um, awaiting their turn to pilot this program. I hope that through ARENA, which means a sand in Spanish, um, this will be my grain of sand uh, to uh, newsroom readiness. And I will help equip uh, journalists uh, a little bit better with tools they need to navigate uh, future natural disasters. I invite you to uh, check the toolkit. It's both in Spanish and in English and uh, to download it. And if you want to implement it in your newsroom, I'm here for you to help you for free uh, to and guide you through the process. And you will also be helping me to track uh, my, my, my project. And I hope that you can very soon start using this little equipment. Great, thank you so much. Any questions for Maria at this time? No, nothing yet. All right, Ariel, you're up. And then mute. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ariel Zich. I'm Science Friday's Director of Audience. Um, and I'm here uh, to help you get started with sensitivity professionals. Science Friday is a small nonprofit newsroom. Um, we're just 20 people in our newsroom. Um, our, our journalists are, are few in number. So um, we, like many newsrooms, um, had at one point in our history approached reporting on marginalized communities. Um, in a fairly like old school or really traditional way. Um, and the risk of doing that um, uh, comes with a lot of risk of harm to the communities that we are ostensibly serving. Um, so those risks uh, happen because of things like misrepresentation, stereotype and trope use, language use that's out of date or um, that isn't aligned with the languages and the, um, that communities use to describe themselves. Um, sourcing bias, image selection even can have it create associative bias in the minds of consumers of media. 
um, all the stuff you've heard before. Um, and I think with us and with a lot of other newsrooms, um, the transition away from reporting on marginalized communities to reporting with them has come with just the most incredible benefits. And our use of sensitivity readers in our newsroom is a part of that change, um, that cultural change. So um, I will start with this image, which um, is a story that our newsroom is very proud of that um, also instigated this, this toolkit, um, which was a story about um, the how medical research was and was not serving trans communities. And what was different and special about this at the time was that every facet from idea inception all the way through um, to promotion and evergreening of this story ultimately passed through the hands of trans identifying journalists, sensitivity experts, illustrators, and producers. And so um, that transition of going again, reporting on that mindset of reporting on a community to reporting with the community was largely facilitated um, by some really amazing sensitivity professionals. Um, sensitivity professionals work to prevent or reduce further marginalization, harm, or exclusion of one or more identity communities. That's like a pretty big bucket. Um, that There are a lot of ways that they do that work. Um, and there are a lot of places that they can do that work. So one of the things that I hope you get from reading this toolkit is that um, sensitivity professionals can help in every single phase of the editorial process, from the idea um, to the reporting, to the sourcing, to research, um, packaging, distributing, social media, live events, um, all of it. There are opportunities there to work with professionals who can help make your reporting more accurate, inclusive, um, and um, fun, actually. Um, the other thing that are things that are really important about sensitivity readers um, or any professional is that they're paid. So if you have people in your um, reporting community or even in your newsroom who are not getting paid for this work, um, they're not they're not getting paid as professionals should get paid. Um, sensitivity professionals always read for their own identities and communities. They're not just people who are good at this stuff, quote unquote. They're people who are experts, and they have lived it, they have lived experience, but they also have expertise beyond lived experience. So they're usually scholars, journalists in their own right. They're people who have spent a lot of time thinking about the shape of harm in media and journalism, particular to their own identity. And lastly, um, they're awesome. You should hire them. Um, so that, that's really what this kit is designed to help you do. Um, as you go through the kit, um, bit.ly doc, uh, you know, bit.ly sensitivity readers that will get you there very quickly. You'll see a quick start guide based on the questions that a lot of journalists, um, both in my newsroom and beyond, have asked about this process. <laughs> like, how do I bring someone in? What does it cost to pay them? Um, how do I write an email to someone I've never worked with before and ask them for help um, with this story that maybe is almost done or that I'm just thinking about writing? Um, the rates data is um, shared. There's some summary data in there. Um, there's also ways that if you decide your newsroom wants to try to staff this role, um, how other newsrooms have staffed this role, how other outlets or even other industries um, name this work. Um, things that um, there's a whole bunch of arguments for different facets of the uh, editorial process that can benefit from it and a um, whole lot more. Um, and then last thing I'll say before I, before I like hat tip is that um, Sensitivity readers are just one of many tools um, in this like process of reporting uh, with communities that have historically been marginalized by media. So um, this is not to say that this is a, a silver bullet. It won't fix everything. In fact, it's um, actually a very low bar to clear, but it's a great way to level up um, and is something everyone should try. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. So we have a couple questions. Uh, CCM hitting allow you to talk so you can... Uh, unmute and ask your question if you'd like. Hello, um, thanks so much for this project. I um, I don't have a question. I just wanted a link, and then uh, I got the okay. link to all the things. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You. And okay. yeah, please Great. dive in. I will say that um, this will be an active revision document for the next three months. So. Um, Though I'm changing my role and moving on to the next chapter of my career, I'm excited to keep this um, in revision and active revision. So um, please jump in there and and um, contribute. And if you're interested in a paid contribution role, there are still some of those available too. So if you're a paid sensitivity professional who wants to like pitch me, um, you can also do that directly. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, one of them is, do you get any pushback for using the word sensitivity? Totally. And actually that was the big, everyone in this um, Zoom probably has heard me like hem and haw about what to call this work um, because sensitivity feels touchy feely. And it's been um, particularly in um, the UK, there's been, um, there's, it's sort of been politicized. 
which is why there's a whole section about what to call this work and how you can define it more precisely for the nature of the job. So even in, even in the same newsroom, there are different sort of tiers of effort, levels of professionalism, styles of editing or revision, and um, sensitivity reader won't always be the most accurate term to use. I encourage you to shop for a better term that works for you. And also like all things related to oppression, things get politicized and become more harmful over time. So it's probably appropriate that the name for this role changes over time. That's a great question. And what is last... the thing most people know? <laughs> And one last question before we go to our next fellow. Um, any examples of how people have been able to get newsroom management to green light working with these professionals? Yeah, so that's one of my favorite questions. Um, and there's a section in this kit called budgeting. And a lot of what it is is about like guerrilla budgeting and how to hide them in other budget lines that already exist. So these people can be viewed as marketing professionals, as freelance editors. They can be viewed as accessibility consultants. They can be billed in and added to projects. Um, I, and I hope that I can start infecting the funding community because this should be a part of every funded um, editorial product. Um, particularly if it's like um, if it's something that's related or centering a marginalized identity. Um, but there's um, I think finding the money that you already have and repurposing it is one of the most important things to do. And then um, I think the the idea of um, sort of wearing away at it by by small experiments, one story at a time, one identity at a time. Um, and especially in those situations of highest risk, because the benefit is is realized and so completely shared among newsrooms that like, I think it sells itself after a few tries. That's what we found. Great questions. Thank you. Great, 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 great. Uh, Arjuna, you're up. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so uh, during the pandemic, I was working with a bunch of uh, local news outlets here in California serving communities of color. And a funny thing happened. Um, uh, three of their sports reporters had been doing this for decades with with them and um they all retired during the pandemic because there was no more high school sports there was no more sports so um they all kind of lost the ability to to report on high school sports and we know that high school sports is such a big institution in the community um their people love to engage in high school sports uh and um so i i went about trying to build this toolkit and a playbook on how outlets who maybe don't have the time or resources to report on high school sports could still do that. And a big part of this is focused on how do we get the com community more involved in our work? You know, how do we, uh, we could have gone the way uh, that most of the kind of mainstream tools out there are looking at is using AI to report on on these very important institutions. But instead we wanted to partner with our communities and, and people within our communities. So you can almost think of this as a kind of documenters for for high school sports, uh, get, uh, getting a bunch of, of people who are gonna contribute. A lot of them are gonna be coaches, parents of athletes, and they'll contribute the scores and some photos and maybe a quick summary of what happened in, the, in their game. Um, so, uh, so I, I will show you. Um, uh, I will show you the toolkit now, and uh, let's see here. So I will show the toolkit now. So uh, this is built in Airtable. Um, uh, basically, we have a bunch of tables with our schools, contributors, the schedule, and results. Uh, the one, the key thing behind this is that. Um, uh, in the schedule, once there's a date of the game is uh, is today, then Airtable will automatically text your contributor and with a link to a form so that they can they can report on the the scores, give a quick um, give a quick uh, summary, and upload any images or photos that they may have. So uh, I don't have that timed for this morning, but I can show you the preview and send that out here. So this is a preview of of the text, uh, and I could actually send it right now if I wanted to. This would just go to myself uh, right now, but so I won't do that. But uh, I have, uh, uh, it just basically says, please report on your team's results today. Uh, links to the form, which I built this form in, uh, in Airtable also, uh, it's linked to a results table so that when, when you fill this out, uh, 
a new result will come here. You can see each one of these are, are results that were reported. Uh, this, these don't have images. Um, so, uh, so it, uh, it, it uh, automatically uh, reminds them, oh, you have a game and please report on it and here's where to do it. Uh, so once they do report, um, I already have this one filled out right here. Um, so once they do report uh, and they submit, we will see there should be, uh, let's see. So we still have the three here. Uh, maybe uh, it's taken a little while to get there. But anyways, once, once that's submitted, uh, a lot of these things take a few minutes uh which is which is fine in the real world but when you're demonstrating it doesn't work quite that way so uh so we have these three results here uh the next part of the toolkit is being able to print out a, a scorecard uh so uh so we have uh we can print all of the records for that day uh so i'm going to show you right here uh we go ahead and print i'm going to save this to pdf and I'm going to save it in my uncropped uh, PDF folder. And uh, so this is for the demo. You can see now uh, we have this demo.pdf. And then um, in just a few seconds, this is going to start working. Uh, up here, where you see the little gear uh, turning. And that's turning it into individual uh, sports card images that can be easily shared to um, uh social media and i i use these as the the featured image on um on uh, a wordpress uh so uh the next thing is i have built in a, a zapier that automatically takes this result uh this result and moves it over to our uh wordpress you can see these uh now the free zapier only only told only polls for new data every 15 minutes. So the one that I just put in is not in there, but um, we can see this uh, this here. So let's go into our our new uh, our new story. It saves it as a draft automatically. Uh, then we can upload our featured image um, here. Oops, let's try and do this. Upload the featured image here. Um, and then publish, and we have a published story that we can move over to uh, social media at any time. So we'll view the post. Here we go. Uh, we have the post that uh, has the contributor um, down here. So community com contributor. Oh, that should have been my full name, but uh, uh, yeah. So that's our uh, that's the toolkit. But the playbook is really focused on kind of building that uh, community network and uh, how to get people involved in the in the uh, in the program. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Any questions for Arjuna at this point? No. OK, I do not see any at this point. So Kate, you're up. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Maxwell and I'm gonna share my screen. So here we go. Um, as I said, I'm Kate Maxwell. I am the founder and publisher of the Mendocino Voice, which is a local online independent news source based in Northern California. So when we first started, we were a two-person newsroom and didn't expect to be covering breaking news. But within a year of us starting, our county had the deadliest wildfire in county history. Um, we lost power and internet for several days in a situation you know, similar to what Maria mentioned. Um, but we ended up being the only news outlet that was able to provide information about evacuations, shelters, resources, press conferences, um, and gained a huge amount of trust and new audiences and, you know, uh, engagement with the community. 
Unfortunately, that was not the, a one-time event, and it turned out we were going to have the state's largest wildfire in history for two years in a row, and then we're going to also have floods and heat waves and power outages for weeks and a variety of other things. So I was really looking for information about you know, how we could be better serving our community and for journalists and small newsrooms, but most of what existed was designed for journalists who are kind of parachuting into communities that they're not familiar with when a disaster happens. So I would think RJI created the News Go Bag project. Um, you know, and our situation is not actually unique as probably a lot of you have experienced in your own communities. The number of, you know, whether or not it's climate change or other kinds of emergencies and disasters, industrial accidents, other things, um, has been increasing. 90% of uh, counties in the U.S. experienced a disaster in the last 10 years. That's only getting more and more. Um, unfortunately, at the same time, as we all know, there's been a pretty serious decline in newsroom employment. Um, and legacy media and emergency notification systems are really not reaching a huge amount of people. Luckily, there is an increase in digital outlets in small new startups um, and independent journalists looking for new ways to connect with their community. And so I think, you know, there's an increasing need for this kind of coverage. Um, more and more people are going to need this kind of information and fewer journalists are going to be in a position, a really crucial role to provide this kind of information in their own communities. But local journalists are really the best position to be interpreters, uh, reach, make those connections in the local information ecosystem between official agencies and community groups and their different communities and readers. So the Local News Go Bag Project um, is a platform to try and start building these resources for local newsrooms and independent journalists, no matter what resources they might have. There is a toolkit that is designed around really concrete, actionable tools that you can start using, templates and other things. Um, at whatever stage of experience you're at. There's also before, during, and after sections that have tips and strategies, whether or not you want to do breaking news, whether or not you can spend a lot of time preparing in advance, or whether or not you're trying to come in afterwards and keep track of all the different response and grants and rebuilding efforts that are happening. There's also readings and resources um, and ways for people who are often working in their own isolated communities or doing really amazing things um, in their own newsrooms, ways for people to connect moving forward um, and support each other doing this kind of disaster reporting work. So the toolkit um, has a bunch of different sections that I'm not gonna be able to show you all right now. Um, there's a reporter and newsroom go bag section which is about supplies and equipment and thinking through what kinds of emergencies you might need and getting together tools in advance. There is an emergency source list and map, so you can start identifying how you're going to get information, what are the ways you're going to verify and share that information, how you're going to get it out to people, where you might go if you need to evacuate or need to be getting news out from a variety of different places, an emergency reporting plan and info needs to think through what are those audiences, how can you adapt depending on different circumstances that might arise, tabletop and hot wash exercises to think through before and after a disaster, what are the different things that worked, what different, how you want to address next time, and a grant data and records request tracker that will also help you on the accountability data and um, you know solutions also level where you can sort of be tracking all the different kinds of agencies and different kinds of funding that might be coming into your, your community at the time. So I'm going to just show everybody one of these since we don't have that much time. Um, here's, you know, the emergency go bag has some information about what kinds of equipment you might need, but there's also a template here with different tiers, depending on what resources you have, depending on what kinds of equipment is relevant to your news outlet or what you might be able to do and the different kinds of emergencies in your area. So those are a bunch of tools that will help you customize and design things for your newsroom. But um, you know, through this research, I talked to a bunch of different people. A lot of newsrooms are just starting to think about this. Other people have done this work in their communities for years and are putting together really creative and innovative ways to 
get information out to people in life-changing circumstances. Um, so one of the things this project is going to be doing, aside from growing those resources and expanding those different trainings, is having a way for people to connect. So um, we'll be holding virtual meetups to just talk about if you want to learn more about this or if you have a lot of experience and have tips and strategies to share and what would be most useful to people in supporting this kind of work moving forward. So I would love to hear from anyone who's interested in more about that. And um, I am over time, so thank you, Kat. <laughs> Good. Any questions, anybody? All right, I do not see any at this time. So Celia, you are up. Great, I'm going to share my screen. That's top two. Okay. Okay. Um, great, okay. Everyone can see my screen? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Celia Wu. My RJI project is on how to build a browser extension for a newsroom style guide. The use case is the global press style guide for which we built a Chrome extension. I've also been steeped in thinking about style guides as a co-chair of the Asian American Journalists Association Style Guide Committee. I believe this is the very first browser extension of a newsroom style guide ever created not even the mighty AP, the world's most used style guide for news has developed one. So why did we decide to build a Chrome extension of the Global Press Style Guide? The Global Press Style Guide is an indispensable and often referred to tool for global press reporters and editors. And it is also used by newsrooms and universities throughout the world. The, the Style Guide is built on the principles of dignity and precision and addresses some of the colonial vocabulary we've grown accustomed to in international journalism. And it's available in three languages, English, Spanish, and French. For such an indispensable and frequently referred to tool, we wanted to give our reporters and editors immediate and direct access to make their workflow more streamlined. Here are photos of our reporters in a training in Mexico and Mongolia. You can see that they are all writing on a single device. A Chrome extension will put the style guide literally at their fingertips without them needing to open a new tab or window. The Chrome extension is a game-changing tool that will help journalists be more efficient and their workflow more streamlined. The Chrome extension is a tool that replicates the same experience as the web version, but is directly accessible via a pop-up window on the same screen and contains the same features as the web version, fast and efficient search, contextual search, which is really important in international settings, uh, cross-references to topics, locations, and rationale, available in three languages, and contains unique features just like the web version has of voice search and save terms. Now I'm gonna do a demo of the, uh, let's see, so I have to, I can still see my screen, right? Um, okay, sorry, this is, oh, here it is. Okay, so here is, um, I've downloaded, this is a prototype of the Chrome extension. Um, I'm gonna activate it. Um, some reason it's intuitive, it comes, it knows that, um, I work in Spanish as well, so I am going to actually go to English. Okay, um, and I'm gonna, let's see, refugee has been a pretty, you, we hear a lot about that right now these days. So I'm just gonna show you how quick the search is, right? Um, and I'm gonna also show you the sidebar in terms of cross-references. All of these terms can be referenced by topics, by locations, in terms of um, this is the, these are the coverage countries of um, global press, rationale, whether the term is relevant to precision, dignity, or both, and sorting. You can sort by newest terms, oldest terms, and alphabetically. And I'm gonna just do a quick demo, change language into Espanol. And let's see, let's see, victima. Without even needing to type the whole word, it knows intuitively where I'm going. So that's how fast the search is. 
and again, um, cross references to themes, um, human rights, educate, you know, all of these themes that we have here, coverage countries, the, the um, justification of, um, or tying into dignity and precision, and again, sorting as well. And one of the things that I wanted to point out too, and I'm just gonna go to the French, French term as well. One of the things I wanted to point out is that um, each of these three style guides in, that are available in English, Spanish, and French are unique to each other. They're not translations of each other, but they have contain unique terms that are relevant to that specific language. So I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Um, okay. Okay, play from comment slide. Okay. Okay, the toolkit. The toolkit chronicles the building of the global press, global press style guide Chrome extension, but it is specific to our instance. We've included loads of screenshots and access to the Chrome extension boilerplate code in our GitHub account. This toolkit will remain a living document and will be updated with our learnings in launching and using this product. And it is built in the spirit of RJI projects that it be universally beneficial to practitioners and educators in journalism. Thank you in our Style Guides Three Languages. Thank you, gracias y merci. I want to give special recognition to my colleague, Andy Neal, our product developer at Global Press. Thank you to RJI and my fellow fellows. I so enjoyed this cohort and thank you to Kat and Randy for your leadership, always thoughtful feedback and infinite amount of patience. For feedback or questions on the Global Press Style Guide and the Chrome extension, you can always email info at globalpress.co and I can always be reached on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Any questions for Celia at this point? No, just lots of compliments, which is always appreciated and great. All right, Stacy, you are up. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Stacy Feldman. I am the founder of Boulder Reporting Lab, a nonprofit local newsroom in Boulder, Colorado, that was born, like so many others like us in recent years, to ensure the continuity of quality journalism in our city as financial firms defund vital reporting. December 30th, 2021 was a pivotal moment for us. And there is at least one theme that has become very evident in these presentations, and that is called the climate crisis amid a local journalism crisis, as Kate described. The county we served that day was hit by the most destructive wildfire in Colorado history, raising more than 1,000 homes to the ground all at once. Boulder Reporting Lab at the time was one month old. Our newsroom focused on immediate information needs becoming a critical source, but as the situation evolved, long-term issues emerged as they do, like severe mysterious health impacts that residents whose homes did not burn were dealing with near the burn area. I felt a responsibility to investigate, but we were just a team of three. It was then that the concept of a community pop-up newsroom was born. It was then that I knew we needed to cover such in-depth issues, that it is our duty in spite of our small size, because no one else would. Size was no excuse. It was time for creativity. I reached out to journalism colleagues at the University of Colorado Boulder, and together we brought in graduate students across disciplines a public radio station, scientists and others for an investigative project spanning one semester. The result of that was an award-winning series that has had real policy impact and importantly, a blueprint for community investigative reporting that has gone missing in so many places, not just mine. Today, I present the Pop-Up Community Newsroom Toolkit. It's this Google Doc. 12 pages long, a digestible guide by design for busy newsroom leaders of small newsrooms wearing multiple hats at once. 
This document is designed to be your inspiration to think out of the box for how to make journalism that matters when it is increasingly difficult to do so. It is a guide in the truest sense in that it is meant to take its readers down a path to try something new, but ultimately it's for you to decide what exact direction to take with it. This model quite literally changed the fortunes of my small newsroom, allowing us to do so much more with less when we were just beginning. The journalism we made through this approach has helped so many people. This is not a step-by-step -step manual per se, but encouragement and inspiration to do the same. So what's in it? Well, let's dive in quickly. First off, we have the hard sell. This guide puts you in a scenario where you feel you need this tool because you do. You're running a small newsroom, even if you don't know it. It answers the question, what even is a pop-up community newsroom? In short, it's a local investigative innovation, a short-term locally focused capacity surge where experienced journalists collaborate with non-journalist subject matter experts to tell untold stories. It's not completely new, this concept of popping up, but this approach is novel. But how can it help you really? The guide explains how this can be used to tackle reporting gaps, particularly during high information demand periods, enabling in-depth reporting without totally overwhelming small newsroom. Because it's collaboration, because it's exciting, because it's new, it opens the door for needed grants and support. We found this in our projects. Not only did we investigate the health impacts of the Marshall Fire in our community with this pop-up approach, but we also tackled the environmental health concerns around a coal ash facility in Boulder, something no one had ever done in our community. Both projects are having real world impact. We received a Pulitzer Center grant, grant on the coal ash project that allowed us to raise our ambition with this work. What must you have to create a pop-up newsroom? This guide will tell you, want to embark on this, but you have no ideas. There are, are ideas here too. Examples of outreach emails, to potential collaborators, and even agreements to copy and paste are included for you, and so are the steps, eight of them, in broad strokes. Finally, to support your journey, there are a list of resources, including essays, breaking down pop-up community newsrooms, and training resources for non-reporters, and I'm also available to help. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Stacy. So any questions now? We have a few minutes. So any questions for Stacy or any of the fellows, please feel free to put them in the Q&A in the chat, um, or you can write them in the Google Doc if you would like. All right. Well, I am not seeing any additional questions at this point, but if you think of anything um, after this presentation, feel free to put it into the Google Doc. I will nudge the fellow whose project it is to get your question answered. But in the meantime, we hope that you use all these wonderful resources in your newsroom. We hope you tell us how it goes, tell the fellows how it goes. We'd love to hear how they work. Um, and we are just so proud of our fellows and all of their wonderful projects. So congrats to all of our fellows on achieving these amazing projects. And we're so excited to see them out in the world doing so much good, which we know they will. So thank you everyone for coming today. 
We really appreciate it. Um, I will be sending out this recording as well. So you can rewatch if you like and all the links. And I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks so much.